Hello and welcome to our first event in our virtual London 2020 conference. I'm Theresa Wise, the Chief Executive of the Royal Television Society, and I'm absolutely delighted to be with Tim Davey, who's just become the 17th DG at the BBC. In the next 30, 40 minutes or so, we'll be exploring Tim's vision for the BBC. But firstly, Tim had a wide-ranging and commercial career before the BBC, which he joined 15 years ago, and was acting DG in 2012 to 13. And he most recently was chief executive of BBC Studios. So Tim, you know the organisation really well. Despite your familiarity with the BBC, has there been anything in the last couple of weeks in the job that's actually surprised you? Um, what surprised me? I, I mean, I, I have done a little trial period, as you remember, with a uh, with, with fairly heavy, heavy crisis. So I'm kind of used to a little bit of what this job is. Um, I, I think when you when you take on these roles, um, it, you forget, frankly, just how much how much volume of stuff comes at you, and that real ability to say, okay, that's important, that isn't. I just forgot how much opinion comes your way, which is weird. It's the joy of it, but it, it's massive. I think the other thing is I've really been focusing, and we'll talk about it, about yeah. the outside world, the public, and I've noticed that, you know, when I'm on a plane landing or whether I'm going on a train, I look at it and I go every household we've got to deliver. I've just, it's been surprising me that I really, this thing about every, every household paying the license fee, just yep. about, us offering value as, as it's not just a line. I, I think it surprised me how that's, that's become part of me now, that focusing on making sure that every member of the public really gets value from us. That's what I'm about. Wow. That's, well, that makes total sense. And I actually wanted to talk a bit more about that because mm. You talk about a universal BBC and why that matters. So what does a modern public service broadcaster look like um, and do in your view? And, and how is that different from how, what the BBC has been doing to date? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is, you know, what I'm about is evolution, not, you know, throwing everything out. In fact, one of, one of my messages is you have to evolve things to protect them. Yeah. So. What I said in my speech was, if if you think about this, and, and I want people to think, without being funny about it, deeply about what's important in this market. Uh, what's important for us as the UK, as I said, as families, and I reflected on that. What, what, is, what do we genuinely care about? And there is good news for the BBC, which is this, this point around, you know, in, in this world, I don't think there's been a be you know, better time for proper impartial news, for proper local regional storytelling, for the things the BBC does well. What changes is the incredible competition. You just cannot take an audience for granted anymore. Yeah. So I think you have to focus, be much more differentiated. In nice words, we've got to do this, but, but it, it, it's, it's that that I want to get to, is something that is truly different, different and differentiated. I think one of the things I've said is, you know, we're not trying to beat Netflix. Yep. We're, I mean, I think this narrative, by the way, is, is, is not where we should be. I'm going to have a few subscriptions. You're going to have a few subscriptions. Yeah. It's whether we are truly valued and essential. You know, it feels indispensable, not for every hour of your media consumption, but for part of it. That's what we're about. So do you think there are some audiences which are actually underserved then in, uh, in the, you talked about the public. So are there audiences in your view which are underserved? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the BBC, but the BBC doesn't deliver equally to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're never going to quite get that right. But, but what I talked about was there are some people who, you know, are getting ex extraordinary value from the BBC. And none of this is a revelation. We can just talk directly. And actually, the numbers overall are pretty good. So 91% of people coming to the BBC average 18 hours a week. Yep. But there are certain bits of the country, and it's not as simple as age, that don't necessarily feel the BBC is for them. Yeah. yeah? And it's not as simple, by the way, as saying it's under 35s. Or it's just... It's often about your life circumstances, where you are, where you live. And I'm not beating ourselves up here. The BBC is extraordinary in how it's connected with an enormous amount of people across the UK. I think we've still got a real bedrock of support to justify a universal fee. But I did say we don't have an inalienable right to exist. 
And that is under pressure. That is under pressure. And there are audiences, you know, that are in a, in a diverse Britain that feel a little bit further away from us. Of course. Yeah. Now, so one of the areas where you sort of really emphasised was you want to appeal to the whole of, of, of Britain. Um, and we've got also this challenge where you've got some job cuts coming in in the English regions, for example, so 450 people going there. Are you worried that some of our English regions might get left behind? I mean, for example, the North East. Um, well, of course, you, you're cons yeah, you worry because yeah. you want to make sure that we have the provision across. And by the way, local and regional program is utterly critical to us. But let's be clear, the metric here is not how many people we employ. It's the value to audiences. OK. And in that particular instance, by the way, I think every area of the BBC has to find efficiency. Efficiency, by the way, doesn't mean I'm diluting anything. It just means I'm doing it better. That's the first thing. And I think there is a sense the BBC could be more efficient in many areas. And it's, and it's done some good work. So this isn't just the new guy coming in and saying it's all, you know, overstuffed with this, that and the other. It's absolutely the, the facts that we've done a lot better over the years in terms of getting more efficient. But there are areas and, and you know, regions is just one of them. You know, a couple of facts, we'll still have over 2,000, well over 2,000 people in the regions. And this is, by the way, just in the news bit we're talking about yeah. here. You know, we do three, I think 3,800 hours of coverage, which will remain the same. It's not as if we're going to be a small player. We're, we're going to do that. I personally would like to look at local regional provision as part of the 22 discussions to say, OK, how could that evolve, go forward? So this is not about just slow you know, stripping of areas at all. Actually, I, I think we can grow. And, and just to, just to, 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 to kind of emphasize the point, more than anything, it's about audience value. So I want people in the Northeast to feel, okay, the BBC is for them. Yeah. I mean, it may be a bit of my commercial past, but you know, I do like a big metric. And I think, you know, one of the things you'd, you'd probably put on the building is the BBC is for me. And that is, that's the metric. You know, if you, we all know it, and, and one thing I said in the speech was a lot of people surround themselves in the media world with people who take that as a given. If you work at the BBC, you kind of do feel that. We need to talk and understand people who don't feel that. Yeah. No, I, I sort of moving on to a kind of related topic. I mean, your predecessor presided over the really vexed decision to charge over 75s who could afford it for the licence fee. What, what's your view on that? Well, I was a board member that wrestled with this. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think it's pretty well-worn territory, this, uh, in as much as we, we absolutely did not want to take on the burden of over 75s. So, I mean, you know, this was a, uh, a, a government uh, uh, benefit that we wanted to keep. Yeah, so that's the first thing. So it was put on us. Um, and then we have the decision, of course, which is you've got, an enormous hole in your finances and that balance between what we do, because this wasn't, this is not a marginal cost, you know, 700 plus million, you're talking about real major changes in the provision of the BBC. And we had the debate. I think we've come up with a solution which, you know, is really difficult. No one, you know, wants to be charging people money they were not paying. It's not a great look, yeah? And, and no one believes, you know, that is an easy thing to do. But I think as a board member, um, and, and just for clarity, I support where we stand. Yep. Um, as a board member, I thought, OK, for the poorest pensioners, those, those you know, who are on pension credit, it was right that the BBC funded you know, their licence fees and, and they weren't charged. Um, but actually for those pensioners who had a bit more disposable income, and I know those people just above pension credit, you know, we're not talking about people with lots of money, this is a tough decision, but it was the right decision that the over 75s pay. We, we thought it, we have made, or we do think we've made a fair decision balancing a properly funded BBC with those who have some ability to pay. It's a really tough thing. We never asked for it, but that's where we are. And, you know, I, I am supportive of where we stand. So let's, um, on a slightly different matter, um, the BBC has seen substantial behaviour shifts with COVID. Mm. Um, I was wondering whether you thought that you'd, you'd see uh, that continuing and whether the BBC is adapting accordingly. 
I don't think we're unique here, actually. After the BBC is unique in probably every way, but on this one, you know, when you talk, I mean, I'm sure you have talked to business leaders, or yeah, yeah. and all of us, by the way. I, I think um, it's such a strange combination of things, isn't it, in terms of the learnings we're getting from COVID. So, so you know, statements of the obvious. We, you know, we won't be in a position where everyone's coming in five days a week. I yep. think, you know, um, I think we'll have more flexible working patterns. Uh, we'll be able to think a little bit about how we use our buildings differently, all of that. Now, we are a production business, so, you know, and a news operation. So at the end of the day, you, you need people in. Um, but we'll take some learnings. I suspect, you know, um, a lot of leaders have found, I think, that, yeah, there are. <laughs> Zooming all day is a particularly uh, horrid experience, yeah. actually, exhausting. Yeah. But actually, there's the ability to do Zoom calls with, you know, um, a thousand people and quickly get a, a connect. I, I, I hated doing video calls, loathe them with a passion. I didn't, but I've kind of thrown myself over the other side. And actually, I can't see myself not using Zoom and other things yeah. in the future. So, look, none of this is a revolution. I'm sure everyone's thinking who's watching this similar things. Um, what, what, as the BBC, we're trying to do is capture some of that best practice quickly so that you don't go back to things. And, you know, there are things like production process, yep. editing, you know, uh, in sheds, you know, uh, as a Gardener's World example. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things we've learned that we would like to replicate. And there is some cost to be saved there. But, I, you know, I'm hoping it kind of we leap forward, take the best of it and get rid of the worst of it pretty quickly. Yeah. What, and what's your balance of remote versus? Um, yeah, as I've just started this new quiet job, <laughs> I've been a little bit more coming in the office uh, in the office. And by the way, I forgot how much I enjoyed meeting real people. I mean, it's just yeah, uh, yeah. I know it sounds obvious, but yeah, you've, you, it's just it's very nourishing in terms of your energy levels and everything else. But I suspect, you know, my average week and, and I'm not. Uh, normal in that regard. I spent you know, two or three days in the office, maybe three days in London, one day out of London, one day at home. It'll be kind of mixed up like that. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to um, a topic that is all CEOs are everywhere looking at um, very intensely, which is sort of diversity targets within mm -hmm. the BBC mm -hmm. and, and delivering plans to improve socioeconomic okay. diversity. Um, how, how are you going to do this? How are you going to affect real change? Yeah, great, big, great question. And the first thing I'm going to do is not necessarily do everything we've done historically. I know that's a, because talk is cheap. And, and I think I, I was very blunt in my speech, which is as a, you know, white male executive, you know, we, w there has been a lot of talking in this. I mean, it, one, of the, one of the things to do for us all as an industry is go back and read the speeches from 10 years ago, by the way. It's a sobering experience. Now, he, he, I think it's a mixed picture. Um, to be fair, um, organisations like the BBC and there are others out there uh, in, uh, that, that have done enormously um, influential and important work on moving forward and, and truly representing Britain. So I think on screen I, I could look at this and say, boy, there's been incredible progress. But internally and particularly across staff, the levels of staff and, and senior leadership is utterly critical to this the progress and the speed of change has been slow. Yeah. So my approach is slightly different to previous, which is what I think's happened a lot in a lot of organizations is we wanna be this type of organization in two years. And I think a lot, talking bluntly, a lot of lower down, low down the organization, people look at it and go, great intent, but I can't do that. Or I, I don't really believe it's gonna happen. Or, and, and there's two things there. One is you feel you just, it's too disruptive or too difficult for you personally. The other is you may not feel we have to do it. It's like a diversity initiative. And I'm, I'm doing two things here at the BBC. I'm saying one is this is mission critical. If we're not, and I think some of the editorial decision making, everything that's going on is utterly dependent on having a truly diverse team. I was very blunt in my first words, don't hire in your own image. There can't be a BBC type or we're in real trouble. Yeah. The other thing I've done is say, I want to create what I'm calling a 50-20-12 organization, which is gender, BA and ME, 20% and 12% with disability. Okay. But what I've done, and we're in the midst of this, is say to the divisional leaders in the BBC, how long would it take you to get it? I'm not going to give a timing in it because I want you to own it. And tell me, except it's hard, except we've got, you know, 
work out specifically what churn do I need in my senior management, how many people are out there I could hire, and come up with, it's granular this, it's really detailed work. So I've got 10 leaders, if I'm gonna reshape it to that, what, what, what's a, a realistic timing, how could I disrupt that? And we're gonna go division by division, real detailed work and try and make it happen. Um, yes, there'll be initiatives, yes, there's a lot going on, but truly it's about leadership and accountability. Final point is um, the leaders in the BBC, I've been very direct, you will not get promoted in this organization without us assessing how you, how happy your staff are and how you delivered against diversity targets. If you are not someone who can deliver on those two things, you will not progress in the BBC. Pretty straightforward. So perhaps another issue um, in that neighbourhood, if you like, which mm. is um, about you know, the, the gender um, and other pay gaps. And we saw Sarah Sands mentioned a particular one that she came across, which is producers versus presenters, for mm. example. Mm. Is that the same sort of approach that you'd adopt on a little that? Bit. Or is I, that I, rather I would pick, I'd be a bit, I would pick apart those issues a bit. Not, I'm not dismissing them in any way. They're just different. So, so with the pay gap, um, yeah, I think on gender pay gap, we're six to seven at the moment. I mean, it's still not, you want to be at level, you, you want zero. Yeah, let's be clear, of course you do. But there are two components to it, aren't there? Of course, and we know this, which is there's equal pay, which, by the way, is, is you know, the law. And, you know, that is a non-negotiable here at the BBC. And, you know, uh, uh, th th there's absolutely, on my watch, it, it's, it's clear, it's, it's absolutely mandatory. It's equal pay. But then you've got representation at different levels of the organisation, which also drives the pay gap. And that is where we need to do more work, yeah? And we're not unique. Um, we beat ourselves up when we're often a lot better than a lot of the industry, but yeah. we have work to do. And, and you know, we're gonna get at that. I think the point you were referring to in different job categories, yeah. um, bluntly, I think we're in different markets. I mean, you know, look, it is, it is strange in, in many of our worlds that, you know, as CEO, by the way, there'll be talent earning a lot presenters earning more than me, that, but that's normal in the TV, TV world. Um, it, it, we could name a number of other categories where, you know, uh, you know, the finance world, or there's a whole load of words, footballers, thank you, yeah. um, where it is different. Um, it, it can sometimes be a bit uncomfortable, but you know, we, we're, we're trying to get value within a market. We, we don't exist fully in a bubble. You know, you can argue that, you know, that the BBC, you know, people come, we try and get a discount, we do all the things we do. but but we want to pay fairly and there is a market. So, so I, I recognise the dynamics of this, but I don't think the solution, frankly, is to say, look, we're going to equalise pay between different job types. That doesn't seem to work for me. So sort of thinking about a, a different topic, really, the BBC's place in the world mm. and the BBC internationally, we, we often hear about soft power of the BBC overseas. I'd love to hear your view about why you think that's so important. Um, it, I think it, it's never been more important. And by, by the way, one, one of the things I feel very strongly is the, the kind of bespoke construct of the UK creative industries should not be taken for granted. A lot of people kind of talk about, oh, well, we've got, we've got this power in the world, we've got these creative industries. And then they've got an issue with the BBC being properly invested in or free museums or... This is not a random occurrence. It, to me, these interventions, these public interventions, combined with very successful creative businesses, you know, look at Sky's success over the years, all these things, it's an incredible model. And part of that is our reputation across the world for trusted content yeah. and quality. Yeah, and, and specifically the BBC, you know, 468 million weekly users of our content yeah, it's huge, yeah? And, you know, I would make the case rather, you know, kind of uh, 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 forcefully that in, in this time of hyper-competition around the world, what do we stand for? And I think one of the things we stand for is this, you know, outstanding trust that we have for the BBC and very high-quality content. And I think other companies benefit from that. 
I think it's not a zero sum game. I think it's an utterly appropriate intervention. You know, we are thankful for, you know, we have some government investment. We'd like more in this area. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build it. I mean, we, I would love to see a billion people coming to our services weekly. And by the way, the data is, is very compelling. If people connect with the BBC, uh, and you know Britishness for all that. So you know, so it, all these terms are loaded, aren't they? But Britishness around the world, they are more likely to trade with us. They are, you know, our creative industries are incredibly strong. And th this, this is not without jeopardy. If you look at what governments around the world are doing in terms of investing in creative clusters, investing in uh, uh, our industry, they want to grow share. So, you know, the BBC, by the way, under my watch, has to be part of a successful growing creative industries, not just winning for itself. That's really important to me. I mean, I think people who know me know, you know, I was very interested in growing the radio market, very interested in the television market. My background is such that I want the market to grow. And that, that's really important the BBC does that in the right way. Yeah, that's... Um, so, you also talked about um, uh, commercial opportunities. So, where, where do you see those biggest um, areas of... of priority for the BBC to grow its commercial revenues? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things there, aren't there? I think, yeah, the, the formation of studios, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so biased, it's embarrassing, but, 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 but now we've got that production base, the opportunity, yeah. yeah. Very simply put, are we, are, we, are we really far on all cylinders across all genres? And I think we've made great progress. You look at, you know, we're writing lots of business in natural history and all of that. Um, that's exciting. So, you know, growing our business as a creative force around the world is, is really, really powerful. I think the, the migration from linear to on demand says, OK, how do we begin now to get into direct to consumer services in the right way? By the way, that is a difficult thing because you, you tend not, as people know that are wise listening to this call, know that, you know, you don't generate a lot of profit short term on that. But building that for the long term, for the long-term future of the BBC, I believe, and we've seen with BritBox that we had some third-party investment as a, we sold a shareholder to AMC when we started, got some investment, worked it together, and now we've got ourselves a nice business there. There is real opportunity across many of our fronts to look now properly at D2C um, and direct to, to consumer businesses. Uh, and there might be other areas that, you know, I've got some thoughts in my head that I'll keep to myself, but there's other areas where we could get growth. I, I'm quite bullish about what we could do around the commercial income. And I mean that you're not the only guys in town that see these big commercial opportunities. So we've seen Netflix, Sky, totally. um, Amazon spend masses of money on huge projects, often using um, talent in the UK and, and British resources. So is this is this a challenge for the BBC having a sort of talent it, arms race? You know, you've got companies that are capitalised to the tune of hundreds of millions. You know, we've got businesses with you know, the, who, who's, whose market value or market cap is bigger than the FTSE 100, I heard on, about Apple the other day. Yeah, this is huge. Now, again, I don't think we can overcomplicate this. It's about focus. It's about, if you are, we are never going to be the biggest media company. I mean, it, it makes me a, a slight wry smile that, you know, we, we at the RTS, a, a, a proud RTS trustee and all these, we spend a hell of a lot of time on the UK media market, yeah. you know, debating the ins and outs. And then, we look, and, and it's a bit like life can be reframed. It's been reframed by the scale of global competition, largely US-led. Yeah. But then we've also got Chinese companies. I mean, you know, companies like Baidu, t t these are going to be billion, billions and billions of dollars investing in content. So what do we do? Yeah, what do we do? Um, you just, you've got to focus. You've got to say, some t we're not going to have all the expensive, most expensive talent in the world, but we are uniquely placed to grow talent. Um, I think we are a force for good. I personally, personally, like working in a place where there's purpose. Yeah. I care about this place. I, I like working here. I, I, I absolutely think in life there are many people, many talented people who want to do something with purpose. I, I think we do something different. What I'm not going to do is compete on the, exactly the same territory. It, it, there's no point. I mean, we, we want to grow talent, be differentiated and be, I said more BBC rather than less BBC. And that's what we're trying to do here. I, I, I think there's an obsession with copying other, you know, looking and trying to copy people that you will not beat on their terms. You've got to win on your terms. And we can do that. It's a win. You know, people say, you know, is it a winnable battle? Of course it's a winnable battle. Yeah. If you focus. 
And that, we've done a bit of that on studios. We certainly do it in the UK well across a lot of the BBC output, but we could do better. Uh, so would you say even more um, research and development, as it were, if you were a pharmaceutical company, you're bringing more things to market? So. Well, that's an interesting line in terms of bringing more things to market. I mean, I'm, I sometimes think we bring, we spread ourselves too thinly, you know. Yeah. So, so I, do, I do think it's about placing your bets. What I do think is about, we're certainly well placed in R&D terms to nurture talent, yeah. to, to get people through. You know, we have our local network. There's things we can do that are incredibly precious. And, you know, um, it, it's no surprise that when we put a decent job out there, and uh, you know we're not sure of applicants. I mean, it, it actually it hurts because particularly uh, those of us, you know, looking at the job market, it looks tough. Yeah. But the BBC is a wonderful place to learn. I, I've learned yeah. in 15 years more than I could conceive of. Yeah, it, it's it's an incredible place. It, it's going to be in, under my leadership. I want this to be a creative place where people are inspired, they learn, and actually we do need, I think, to be giving people a break sometimes a bit earlier and say, we'll risk it, we'll do it. That's what we do. That's yeah. what we do. And, and I, I, you know, if I, I, I tend not to look back at the glory days and say, oh, I remember, you know, but there are, you know, if we look back as an industry, have we become too risk averse? Are we willing to take bets on really, you know, young, <laughs> developing talent early? Um, or are we just playing too much, too, too safely? Now, the great thing about the license fee funding and all the things is we're the ones that can take that risk. And I think we are doing, by the way. I think I, think I could name dramas, you know, normal people. I made these, All those things where, where we're, we're taking those risks and I want to continue that. Um, so I just want to move on to another really critical topic, um, impartiality. So you yeah. said, to quote, you in, said. <laughs> to quote yeah. impartiality is the bedrock of who the BBC is, yet too many people consider the BBC to be shaped by a particular perspective. So um, what are you planning to do to change this and what, how, how, what does that mean in practice? Um, I, I think the, the, the first thing I say is it, it, it means that we together renew our vows a little bit on impartiality. By the way, I think, you know, before we go completely over the top here, the vast, amount, the vast majority of the BBC output I would defend, you know, is I think we do a brilliant job of delivering it, impartial output in terms of often on the left right axis, by the way. And by, that's what I'm, I'm not really just focusing. I know other people would think that would be the easy thing, left right. But I do think there's something about metropolitan based organisations or the way you hire that can somewhat feel a bit distant from some of the population. And it's not left and right. It's more complicated than that. It's about going to the top of this discussion. Do I feel it's for me? Okay. And then I, then I think we're in, a, we're in a challenging situation if we want to deliver impartiality. Because more and more people, actually, young people particularly, are struggling with the whole idea. They're surrounded by everyone having opinion. And I think this changes the grammar a bit of editorial, editorially, because often if I'm asking you a question, some person, someone might go, oh, that you're asking it not because you want to get to truth, but because you've got a partisan view. So part of what I was trying to do in that speech, and I think it's, it is needed, is say, OK, do we really believe it's deliverable? And I do. OK. And, and absolutely, you don't need, I know that you could probably get more short, short term, more Twitter followers by being outrageous, but actually there's something, a bigger purpose here, and it's going to, longer term, it'll, it'll put us in a stronger position, okay? So we need to really get excited about impartiality and finding truth, evidence, testimony. If you're not passionate about that, I was very clear, you know, you're in the wrong place. So that, that's, that's important. And then the other thing is, I said, it is deliverable. It, it, it's, it's not a desirable, it is deliverable in this. So, so you, look, I'm, I, I think um, the modern world's gonna test us on this. It, it's demanding, it's, cult, it's a time, isn't it, where you know, we're working out who we are as a society, all those things. This, is gonna be, this needs constant um, uh, oversight, editorial governance, but it's exciting. And it's what we should be doing as the BBC. And I wanna protect that. Uh, because it comes down to trust. It, you, you, you value something you trust. It's as simple as that. And people need to trust the BBC. And we need to be very clear to everyone about what our intent is. Yeah. And our intent is to get to an impartial, properly balanced um, uh, look at what happened.
Yeah, well, thank you. I've, I've got one sort of final area before we wrap up, uh, which is online. Mm. Um, you said that as that was another area you identified for change. Um, yeah. What needs to be different here, do you think? Um, I think we've got, in simple terms, I think we've got a great set of products. Yeah, iPlayer, Sounds is doing well. You know, the news site has fantastic numbers in terms of reach. But you could argue it's quite a good reflection of the corporate structure. <laughs> yeah. And, and the question is, what's the right way to link up you as a, a consumer? Dare I say even customer? I'm not, you know, overplaying that. But how do we allow you to extract more value? And I'm all about value. You know, my, you know how do you get more value for your £157.50? Yeah. That's what I'm... That's, oh, Simply, yeah, there's the, there's the societal value of the BBC, but actually what it really boils down to in terms of support for us being funded universally, everything is, do I and my family get enough value? So surely in a world of online, we should be able to tune this so you can get more from us. And we, across the BBC, we have a kind of angst, which is, if only you knew what we did, if only you knew about that programme. Now, we've done a lot of heavy lifting in terms of building the data set Sorry, yeah. to, sorry to get dry, but the data, or oh, everyone, the data set, the log, you know, we've got 40, 40 plus million people logged in. Yeah, all of that. Now the question is, how do you make that? that I think the jargon is the frictionless experience mm -hmm. across the BBC. How do we link it? Have we got a clear vision for that? And to make sure we don't get left behind in the market. Yeah. And, and, and I think that is urgent for us. The exciting thing is, if we could get that right, imagine how much value we could unlock. It really, I mean, it's mechanical. It's not, you know, uh, kind of, uh, it's literally science, some of it, which is how do you use the algorithm to know that 11 o'clock at night when I finish the normal program on iPlayer, uh, other services are available, but I, on, my, on the iPlayer, what do, I, where, what do I do? You can learn a lot about me. So we know that competition um, or the market is working hard in these areas. We need to be, we need to be razor sharp. So we could envisage in the future a sort of Rethian BBC algorithm, which is recommending a stuff to you. BBC algorithm. I hadn't thought about that, but um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's actually it's interesting that because I, th I think we we at the BBC have got to create our own blend here because yeah. um, you know we're not just trying to extract value from a limited number of subscribers. We're trying to be and. and and we're trying to offer value across across the board. So it means that we've got to curate and have an editorial voice. Part of what I like about the BBC News is I want to know what BBC thinks and the BBC Newsroom <laughs> thinks are the big stories. I, just, I don't want stories that are wholly about where I live or my football club. I want that curation, yeah. but I also want personalization. So I think that's, we've got to probably do it on our own terms rather than be wholly algorithmically led. Yep. But we've got, a, we've got a balance curatorial and algorithmic in our own beautiful, frictionless way. Now, that is not easy, but there's, there's, yeah. there's real opportunity for us there. Oh, fantastic. So, um, so just finally, I know you probably don't get much spare time these days at all, but um, what do you love watching or listening to um, um, in that time? Yeah, I mean, listening, I am a very heavy consumer of radio and, and 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 i'm actually quite eclectic on that i'm not just saying it to be diplomatic but i do i listen to a lot of sports so test my special all those things whatever uh six music i do an enormous amount is often my you know uh my my listening over the weekend radio four during the during the i i i, I do listen to radio drama a bit i've always been a fan of radio drama i'm a little bit nostalgic about some of the old comedies on four extra so i don't so a lot of listening um, on television, okay, I, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's a classic mix. I mean, you know, if, if you want recommendations, I mean, Once Upon a Time in Iraq, a documentary if, if, is a must watch. Um, I actually watched another documentary on iPlayer, Hitler's Children. You know, there, there's some great stuff there that I'll watch, a really, really good documentary. I'll, I'll escape like everyone into the, 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 the dramas. Um, you know, uh, I think it's Lucky White, isn't it? The Corman Strike documentary, uh, doc, sorry, drama at the moment. Yeah. Those kind of programs. And then, and then from the competition, you know, um, I just saw the Michael Jordan doc, Last Dance, mm -hmm. uh, really good, great piece of work. Um, what else? End of the effing world. I, I've, I've been catching that. Oh, it's been a while since I saw the first. The first season was so brilliant. It's been, I've been slow to get to it. But things like that. I mean, uh, 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 all kinds of things. Um, and now, of course, I get quite a lot of recommendations for what to watch from the shop floor. So I'll be, I'll be doing that. 
looking forward to that. So, um, well, I just want to thank you so much for, for your time. It's just been such a pleasure. It's just a real wide ranging discussion. We've covered a ton of really meaty stuff, but we've also covered a lot of different subjects. So thank you so much for having one of your first you. outings with us at the RTS. Um, and um, just, um, I would also like to thank YouTube who are actually um, partnering with the RTS and sponsoring the series of senior leader sessions. Um, with the RTS and um, and also thank to everyone for for, for joining us and watching us um, uh, We will be sort of holding further autumn sessions with senior leaders So look out for those and we've got a really fantastic and varied autumn slate as well. So um, thanks so much